On today's edition of the Locked On Florida Panthers podcast, we are bringing in Nick Fairbanks on the show to discuss the 3-2 win over the Tampa Bay Lightning in the Panthers preseason home finale on Thursday night. We're also going to discuss the Locked On NHL power rankings as voted by all the Locked On hosts. Where do the Florida Panthers stand and do we agree where they stand right now? And in the third and final segment, we are going to preview the final preseason game against the Tampa Bay Lightning Saturday at Emily Arena. We're going to discuss that next here on the Locked On Florida Panthers podcast. Your Locked On Panthers, your daily podcast on the Florida Panthers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Your Locked On Panthers, your daily podcast on the Florida Panthers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome into this Friday, October 7th edition of the Locked On Florida Panthers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. Thank you for making the Locked On Florida Panthers podcast your first listener of the day. I'm Armando Velez, and you can follow me on Twitter at MondoMan12. Follow the show account on Twitter at LO underscore FLA Panthers. Don't forget to also subscribe to Locked On Fantasy Hockey with Flip Livingstone and Stu Roden and Locked On NHL. We'll be covering all the preseason activities around the National Hockey League. And today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a Fairbanks Friday edition of the show. It is a game recap edition of Fairbanks Friday. And Thankful to be bringing in Nick Fairbanks here on the show after we after missing last week due to the hurricane uh, coming into my area. So, Nick, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Armando. Uh, glad to hear that everything is okay in your area, that you're safe. Panthers hockey is finally back, and we finally get to talk about a preseason game, or at least you know recap a game again. It's been uh, it's been a few months. Yeah. Uh- you know, when it, when it comes to recapping a, a game versus t- forecasting everything, we we actually get to see, we actually get to talk about more of the the process of what this team is versus versus what we think is what we think is going to happen, and maybe sometimes, of course, during the summer, w- we might think that this this one thing could be best for the team, and ends up that of course the coaches do something differently. And let's get right into that. That uh, we've been talking about a little bit all summer about how to fix the power play going into the postseason. Yeah, sure. This team finished top five in in the regular season in power play. Of course, one for thirty one. And one of the things that I did not really talk about really all summer was Brandon Montour being the QB on the power play. And of course, we. Ha- there was a little bit of that time last week in their home preseason game against the Carolina Hurricanes, uh, a game that a lot of Panther fans were not able to watch. Uh, but Brandon Montour getting the game-winning goal, running the point. I, I had a little bit of my opinions on Brandon Montour being the the point guy. Uh, from what you saw yesterday and, and of course, him getting the game-winning goal, what, what, what's your thoughts on uh, Brandon Montour being the, the QB of PP1? Uh, it may be an unpopular opinion because I think that, um, you know, a lot of people rather have number five, Mr. Aaron Eckblad, be the quarterback. But um, I really like Montour as a quarterback. He's mobile. He moves the puck very well. And he can get into positions that 
um, make the Panthers more of a dangerous team or a dangerous threat. Um, whenever he was on a power play the previous season, um, he was always the defenseman sneaking down low to look for a chance and everything. And I think that's what Florida needs. I think they need to change their dynamic up. They're a little bit too, um, you know, uh, they stood around a lot, you know, they just kind of set up in a zone where they would just pass around and then hopefully a shot would go in or they would have a rebound right in front. But um, I think the fact that they have a mobile defenseman back there again, um, kind of like, you know, a little bit of a um, Brian Campbell, uh, they're able to show a different look and, uh, you know, it, it proved to be successful. So uh, I'm very happy with it, that move. Mm. And you're putting your shooters in position to shoot like your Ekblads and Barkoff, your net front presence in Rhino and and Kachuk as well. So chances are this could be a a unit that could that could go well for the Panthers. And of course, you're not really expecting shots from the point to go in. Uh, of course, great uh, great screen by Etulus uh right in front of the net to help Brandon Montour convert on on the power play. And also another player that I want to talk about and I, I I've spoken about this guy a possibility of making the team but I think after last night especially getting uh five uh shots on goal Alexi Hepaniemi Nick he's making the team I I certainly hope so um he's been he, he definitely has the tools to do it. Um, it's just, you know, you wonder if it's going to be able to last over an 82 game season. Um, he's had little spurts here and here, here and there with the team. Um, I remember specifically, I think it was a season or two ago that him and Duclair, uh, teamed up on a game winning goal against Detroit. Um, him being able to hit the puck right out of the air to show the hand eye coordination skill that he has. But, um, just another great, um, you know, find in the draft and I think somebody who's going to play smart and uh, play that defensive two-way hockey that Florida is going to definitely need uh, to be successful not only through the season but also possibly as somebody they can depend on um, you know in the postseason as being able to be a lockdown forward mm-hmm. and I was also and happening I mean was um, on on second chance attempts multiple times even after he scored him and right and seemed to have built uh, some type of chemistry hmm. out there last night. I'm not sure if they play on the exact same line, but hey, uh, this is a little bit of an experiment that Paul Maurice is putting out there. And of course, there was more tempo with this uh, Florida Panthers team against a, a a Tampa Bay lineup that was mostly a a dress rehearsal type of um lineup that they had compared to what the Florida Panthers have. Uh, of of course, there's still a few uh, players missing from the Panthers, which we'll talk about more in segment number three. But hey, a fully dressed, uh, mo- for the most part, Tampa Bay lineup. Uh, they they clogged up the neutral zone. I saw Alexi Hepaniemi have a strip of Victor Hedman just as uh Hedman was entering the zone. So positionally sound for Hepaniemi, and and when you look at five on five for the Panthers, uh, Corsi four percentage sixty one to thirty two on five on five. So they're they're control they're controlling they're, they were controlling the pace they were working the puck around they were trying to finish on second chances uh converting on the power play i mean yeah sure it's a preseason game but you don't you don't apologize for for wins in, in the preseason so it, it looks I, i'm 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 glad even though it was a little bit of a slower start from the second double header to kind of the last two games against carolina uh, I'm I'm more I'm more looking at how they look at the end of the preseason versus how they fare in the in the first part as as far as new players coming in and and new line combo. So this part is really uh, where I judge the team more going before opening night. Yeah, and I think you have to kind of look at it that way because if you start the preseason and the team looks sluggish and not you know overall in shape, not ready. Um, you can definitely tell that it might be because, you know, there's an experience there, a lot of guys juggling for position. But if the team doesn't improve over, you know, uh, a course of a few weeks and you don't see them gelling, then that's probably a cause of concern. So it looks like this team is actually bought into what Paul Maurice is trying to facilitate with the team is more of a defensive minded, uh, you know, team play, whereas, um, you know, maybe previous seasons, you didn't really see that. It was more of a run and gun game, use speed and uh, try to track down the puck. Um, I will say this about the preseason in Tampa Bay. How many times have the Panthers played Tampa and thought that they, you know, 
hey, this is going to be it. This is going to be the turning point in, you know, the, the rivalry where Florida thinks that, hey, we got them now. We're, we, we were in their heads. And then Tampa shows up and just completely demolishes them and just says, hey, you know, we weren't really playing or we weren't, you know, playing up to our ability. Mm-hmm. Um, not to say that that's what happened last night, but, you know, as you said, it's preseason. I wait for the games to actually begin, and I can't wait to see what the game is going to be like in March and April to see if the teams actually, um, you know, are fine-tuned and actually, you know, care. You know what I mean? <laughs> I feel. Uh, I mean, Tampa's 0 for, 4, 0 for 4 in the preseason, but how many uh, people are writing them off as far as a playoff contender? I, I, I see nobody is uh, writing them off. Uh, honorable mention of uh, – for this game is of course Sergey Bobrovsky. Even even though the Panthers really took care of him and uh, eliminated most uh, high danger scoring chances on Sergey Bobrovsky, still twenty six of twenty eight, and and of course Zach Dalpy getting his second goal of the preseason a call up. I see Zach Dalpy more of a in case of emergency break glass kind of situation as like a call up for Paul Maurice. Uh, with, but for Sergey Bobrovsky, uh. Paul Murray spoke about how he doesn't really uh, focus too much on the goalies. He lets Robbie Tallis do all that, but it's it talked about mostly a shot counter for, for Sergei Bobrovsky going into the final preseason. And of course, Spencer Knight as well on Saturday, but 26 of 26 of 28, a, a lot of the talk of, uh, around the last few weeks has been, Oh, this is going to be the most expensive goalie tandem in the NHL. What are the Panthers doing about their goaltending? But despite the high price tag that the Florida Panthers have on their goaltending, what are the chances at, at, that this could end up being possibly the best tandem in, in the NHL, possibly a Jennings Trophy type of tandem th- this season? Wouldn't that be something? Mm-hmm. I mean, you have you know the two-time Vesna winner, Bobrovsky, in a way still trying to prove himself here in South Florida. I mean, he's had one exceptional season in three so far. Yeah. Um, if he can take his game to another level down here, it's all gravy for Florida. And then you have, you know, Spencer Knight, who's still trying to uh, develop and become that number one guy. I can't ask for a better situation. Now is the, you know, at the end of the day, is the, uh, <laughs> is the money going to be concerning? Definitely. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, you, you have to think of, you know, what's going to be best for the team going forward. I mean, is Bobrovsky give him the better chance to win today? I think so. But in the future, it's going to be Spencer Knight. And sometimes you have to bite the bullet and, you know, pay the guys that you're going to need, you know, here for the team to, you know, carry you in the future. So um, very happy to see that Bob is, you know, already looking like he's going to be, you know, hopefully in midseason form. I hope it carries off into the first week of the season. Uh, He's usually not a quick starter. Um, but hopefully with this new defensive type system that Paul Maurice is putting in, um, he'll be comfortable and be able to kind of shine, uh, and get off to a good start. Yeah. No reason to believe that he's not the opening night starter for, for the Panthers come October 13th against the New York Islanders. So, uh, unless something changes, uh, I'm expecting Bob to be between the pipes October 13th, but we're going to transition over to segment number two, where we're going to talk about. Lock the locked on NHL power rankings as voted by the locked on hosts. We're going to discuss that next here on the Locked On Florida Panthers podcast. But first, we're going to tell you all about Bet Online. And BetOnline.net is your number one source for all your football betting info this season. Find all the latest player developments, team matchups, news, and podcasts, and in depth articles and analysis on every game you can find. And as always, Bet Online remains your continued source for all your sports wagering information with live betting and up to the minute scores. For every sport out there, the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite games and events, including MLB, MMA, boxing, and golf. Head to betonline.net or use your mobile device to learn more. BetOnline, where the game starts. Thank you for making the Locked On Florida Panthers podcast your first listen of the day on this Fairbanks Friday edition of the show. So, Nick, let's. This is. We are. Six days away from uh, from opening night now, less than a week. First of all, I didn't ask you at the top of your sh- at, at the top of the show. How are you feeling ab- that we're less than a week from puck drop? I am elated because 
as I tweeted out earlier this week, that uh, I'm kind of over the NFL season already. Uh, I'm not a Dolphins fan, just disclaimer there. Uh, it's no surprise, uh, but I am a Bears fan. So, yeah, I'm ready for the season to be over already. <laughs> um, but, no, I just uh, – I, I think I've kind of grown bored with, um, you know, other sports right now, and I think the NHL is the only one that kind of, like, really brings uh, the excitement out of me or the jitter of it just because I also play. But um, – I think I'm just more ready to, you know, get ready to go. I'm, I'm kind of tired of like talking about the what ifs and what this team could possibly do. I want to see what the product's going to be on the ice and see, you know, what they're going to be doing, you know, game in and game out to transition. Because listen, we've talked about this all summer. It's going to be a process where they're going to be learning how to play the new system. Um, you know, are we going to figure out if the offense is actually going to take a step back or, hey, maybe Maurice is going to be, you know, allowing them to actually be more open with their offense like they have been and score a lot of goals. But I just want to get back to watching hockey, having fun, going through the ups and downs and everything like that. I'm ready. I, I have the energy for that. But we have to take it one game at a time. And I just can't wait for opening night, man. I, I just I, I, I want to see the product on the ice because I think might be a uh, – might be an unpopular opinion. You know, that's 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 my thing. I think this team's going to be better than last season. Not point total, mm -hmm. but I'm talking about the overall quality. I, I think the team itself is going to be better than it was last year. And it's about playing your best hockey at the end of the season versus uh, versus the, the regular season in the beginning, especially. And how you feel about uh, the NFL, uh, about your boredom with the NFL, that's how I feel about baseball right now. And what what a coincidence! The Marlins are bad, which brings a uh, which brings my joy for baseball at a, at a kind of a low right now. Same thing with the Chicago Bears. Give uh, Justin Fields a wide receiver help, please, uh, for for crying out loud. But let's go over uh, these uh, power rankings uh, for the Locked On NHL channel, and uh, and let's go over uh, where the Panthers uh, stand here. Uh, Nick, by the way, can you see this? By the way, I'm all good here. Thank you. All right, so. So let, let's go over, like, the bottom five first. Uh, Montreal, San Jose, Philadelphia, Chicago, and Arizona. Uh, I, I think the bottom five is just about right, but I would just mm – -hmm. I just think Chicago is, like – I just I think with how, perp, how they're trying to lose on purpose, I think they should go to that final spot. And, of course, we've also spoken about Philadelphia all summer – Really, on the talent on the ice is worthy of a possibly number one overall pick, but of course the the pressure that's coming from the coach and him sending actual letters uh, to his players about you got to be ready for uh, you better be ready for training camp. Uh, I, I I could see them falling a little bit uh, higher than uh, number thirty. Of mm -hmm. course, San Jose has a new GM, new direction, and of course Montreal just came off a number one overall pick just recently uh where do you where are you seeing the the bottom five uh right now for the nhl so i'm actually going to change it up a little bit so um i actually think in the bottom you're going to be seeing uh the chicago blackhawks in number 32 i think the canadians are going to be number 31 and then i'm going to actually elevate the coyotes up to around maybe the 28th or the 27th spot mm -hmm. and i'm actually going to move the flyers up just a few more because I think that they have the direction now. It doesn't matter the skill that they have on the ice. I don't think John Tortorella is going to allow them to be that bad. Um, I think a lot of people kind of wrote him off when he went to Columbus and everything. And look what he was able to um, muster out of that team. I mean, yeah, they had some skill. They were able to bring in some stuff, but he was able to get the best out of a lot of their players there. And I think he's going to do the same thing in Philadelphia. San Jose for me is probably in the right spot right now. I don't really see them doing uh, a lot. They have a lot of contracts, unfortunately, still there that um, I don't think are doing them any favors, but at the same time, um, you know, they're doing, you know, what they need to, they're in a rebuilding mode. So, um, you know, they'll probably get a top three pick. So uh, that's where I'm at. I think the coyotes are actually be better than what people think. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about middle of the pack uh, teams in this in this power rankings. One one team that uh, and by the way, this poll of for power rankings is voted by all the locked on NHL posts. Uh, I see Dallas at number seventeen, and I think that was probably voted prior to the Jason Robertson uh, extension. I think mm -hmm. it could be a, 
a little bit higher. Same thing with the LA Kings. Uh, I think they had a very, very encouraging uh, first round against the Edmonton Oilers, taking them all the way to seven games. Uh, it, it's going to be another year of growth. Drew Doughty is going to be back. Quentin Byfield, hopefully he's going to take another uh, step. They got Kevin Fiala on, on the wing. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think I think this is, could be like maybe like a few spots up for the L LA Kings, maybe like a 12 or 13. Uh, Boston, I think they they could be a little lower here, like maybe like 16, 17, of course, with their fair share of injuries. And mm -hmm. that so as far as as far as the disagreements here, those are the three that I have there. So I will piggyback on the Dallas Stars, I think, you know, with 17 and uh, Jason Robertson finally signing, I think that pushes them up and I could put them in a 12 or 13 spot, you know, taking over for Boston or even Nashville. Um, one thing I will say about Dallas is that whenever Pete DeBoer takes over a team, their first season is usually pretty good. I mean, look at Florida. I mean, he took that team to like, what was it, like 92 or 93 points and just missing the playoffs by a tiebreaker, basically. And then his first season, I think, uh, you know, when he was over with um, San Jose, they had a pretty successful season. I think they went to the Stanley Cup. And then, you know, over in Vegas, um, you know, maybe not so much of uh, the same, but he was able to get them to the Western Conference Finals. Um, one team that I am going to drop is the Ottawa Senators. I think that is an overhyped team right now. Mm -hmm. I think everybody's just talking about all the additions that they made. Um, I am still worried about their goaltending, and if I'm not correct, go ahead and correct me, but I think their goaltender got hurt, and he's out for a considerable amount of time. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, so he's going to be out for a little bit. I'm going to drop them down actually probably past New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, I think they have the scoring ability, but to me it comes down to goaltending and defense. And then the Golden Knights, that, that right there, mm -hmm. number 18, you couldn't say that in previous seasons. They were usually probably a top 10 team. They are now seeing the fruits of trading all their picks, all their stars for nothing. Mm -hmm. I can see them keep going, you know, considering, you know, what they've been able to do going down. But, you know, I will give credit uh, to Bruce Cassidy um, if he can turn things around there. Mm -hmm. Logan Thompson's projected to be their uh, number one goalie for opening night. Uh, <laughs> the... the... Mark Stone injury starting off for for them. He's in non contact. Uh, Nolan Patrick's not going to play this season. Robin Leonard's not going to play this season. So dis disaster these last few years for uh, the Vegas Golden Knights. But if they can find a way somehow to to just get get the defense right as far as, as especially the goaltending, th we could see that go higher. But I'm not really anticipating it uh, for. Uh, Vegas. Uh, let let's. Can I make uh, one more prediction? Go ahead. I do think Detroit's going to be better. I know I feel like I have to talk about them every show, but I honestly could see them going from the twenty-two spot, maybe into the seventeen or eighteen or seventeen spot. Um, just because from what I've been able to see this preseason, their defensive game is much improved, and if they can get that type of defense and that goaltending, um, I think their offense is going to flourish from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you talk about the the, the additions that they had. Vili Husso, David per David Perron uh, is is on the is on the Detroit Red Wings uh, now. So uh, definitely a, a season that could show some growth. And of course, Dylan Larkin's going to be in a contract year this year for Detroit. So uh, he he's got something to prove as far as like I I think he's still going to be a Red Wing past this season. But as far as like mm -hmm. he, he ha definitely has more to prove for himself. Let, let's round out the top. Let's go around the top 10 and uh, talk about where, if we agree uh, where the Panthers are. So top 10 is St. Louis at 10, Minnesota 9, Edmonton 8, Florida 7, Calgary 6, New York Rangers 5, Carolina 4, Toronto 3, Tampa Bay 2, and Colorado Avalanche number 1. And of course, usually in power rankings early on in seasons, usually the the Stanley Cup uh, winner and, and runner-up usually most – most times in most sports are usually round up the top one or two, uh, which I don't have, I don't have necessarily an issue with. Carolina has been knocking on the door. Toronto has also been knocking on the door. The one that I, the one team that I think is a little too high is probably the New York Rangers uh, mm -hmm. at number five, five on five uh, last year were one of the worst teams in the NHL. And uh, I think they rely heavily, heavily on Igor Shesterkin. Uh, and 
I, is he going to have a repeat of last season? I, I wouldn't be surprised if he does, but uh, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if uh, they, they're going to have to need more scoring if, if they're going to live up to that top five uh, bid. So I, I would actually put the Rangers like maybe like around eight or nine. And, and this is where I think the Panthers should ultimately land at number six as far as the best team in the NHL, in the NHL as far as preseason power rankings. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I completely agree with you with number one and number two. I think that both teams deserve that. Um, you know, Colorado coming off of their win, uh, the Stanley Cup, and then Tampa Bay coming up just short. Um, those are definitely the two best teams in the NHL. But as you said, the Leafs and the Hurricanes are knocking on the door. I think the Hurricanes retooled very well this offseason. They were able to acquire some pieces that I think might be able to push them uh, over the hump there. And the New York Rangers, um, yeah, if Shostorkin doesn't play like he did last year, this team is not going to be in the top 10. Uh, I could definitely see them dropping down to maybe 11 or 12. Um, and then you have the Florida Panthers' new uh, partners in crime, the Calgary Flames with uh, Mr. Jonathan Huberto and Mackenzie Weger. Um I think everybody's buying the Kool-Aid there saying that, oh, they won the offseason just because of the moves that they were able to make, which, you know, full credit to, uh, you know, the GM and that organization. But um, I think they're going to take a step back. Um, I, I think that what they're able to build there over the last couple of seasons was, you know, it didn't work out the way that they wanted to. And they lost control and they lost to Chuck and everything like that. It's going to take some time for them to kind of rebuild that mojo. Um, I still see them as a top 10 team but they're going to have to repeat exactly what they did last season with new players. And I think that's something that, um, you know, it's very hard to do. Now you can argue that Florida is going to have to do the same thing coming off of president's trophy winner, um, retooling the team. Uh, Florida could either be as high as maybe number four, I want to say, depending on how they play, or they could drop out of the top 10, just depending on the stretches of games that they're going to have here. So, and also if the defense and the goaltending come to play, um, I would say Edmonton, I think would be a little bit higher on my list just because they have Connor McDavid and that guy's already looking like he's seasonal ready. Yeah. Uh, Minnesota and St. Louis, um, those two teams are just going to grind it out. Um, I'm really happy to see what Minnesota is doing. That's going to be a really tough team to play uh, here in the next year or two, just with big bodies and the way that they're going to play. And it just seems like St. Louis, they never go away. Um, you know, they're, they're kind of like the Boston Bruins of the West. They just, they always are able to retool. They're always relevant. And, you know, they always find a way to make the playoffs or make some kind of noise. So, um, yeah, I, I think that, you know, probably the top three or four teams are a lock. Anything from five to 10 could shift uh, either just gradually or I could see them dropping out of the top 10 completely. Yeah, and in, Ed in Edmonton, you have a better goalie situation with having uh, Jack Campbell in the mix uh, now uh, for, for them. So, and of course, you have Kirill the Thrill there. Uh, Marco Rossi, Rossi, uh, rookie coming in for the Minnesota Wild. He he's a guy definitely uh, to watch. Uh, a lot of people are having him as a possible Calder winner uh, mm -hmm. th this year. And like you said, with St. Louis, they're a team that doesn't go away. They they lost they lost. Of course, their captain in Progangelo just a few years ago, and and they still have been able to to still stay afloat for for in the in the NHL. So that so I uh, uh, so. The people listening, tell us what you think about these uh, locked on power rankings. If you are watching on YouTube, you could see the actual uh, rank rankings here and see them one through thirty two. So m make sure to tell us what you think about these uh, power rankings as voted by the locked on NHL host. But in segment number three, we are going to discuss the upcoming preseason game in Tampa, Florida against the Tampa Bay Lightning. Four p.m. start at Emily Arena. We're going to discuss that next here on the Locked On Florida Panthers podcast. Your Locked On Panthers, your daily podcast on the Florida Panthers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to this Fairbanks Friday edition of the Locked On Florida Panthers podcast on this Friday, October 7th edition of the show. Nick Fairbanks is back. And Nick, 
So Paul Maurice, after uh, the game last night, spoke about all the players who will be back for their for their preseason game on Saturday. So, you know, this is also the time for the Panthers, of course, to not run any, everyone out there, not risk any injuries, especially, I mean, in their preseason game yesterday, uh, the Tampa Bay Lightning had a little bit of a scare when there was a collision with between Zach Dalpy and Steven Stamkos. Uh, mm. was limping a little bit and then uh Steven Stamkos ended up not missing a ship but of course that's the risk out you you put out there but of, of course uh he said that the plan it, he said the plan is for Bennett, Kachuk, Verhage and uh Colin White and Nick Cousins to play if everything goes well at practice and the Panthers did confirm that they will be having a 12 p.m. noon practice today at FLA Live Arena so we'll know more about if those guys uh, play on Saturday. 4 p.m. start, m- m- another dress rehearsal type of game for, for the Panthers. Spencer Knight is going to be between the pipes, expecting another full game out of him again. Uh, just really, for if, if, if we saw anything out of Thursday, and of course, if we see a repeat of that on Saturday, then I'm going to feel really good about heading into opening night next Thursday. For sure. And, um, you know, as you said, you know, the, the biggest thing uh, coming out of the preseason, you want to make sure your starters and your top players are not going to be injured. Um, you know, the the fact that, you know, Zach Delpy and uh, Steven Stamkos had uh, a little bit of a collision and he was kind of limping and everything, uh, kind of a scare. Um, if we saw that with Barkoff and everything, I'm pretty sure Panthers Twitter would be freaking out right now. Um, but glad to hear that Steven's OK and that it's nothing too serious. He didn't miss a shift. Um, but going into uh, the game, uh, the next game, I'm very interested to see if uh, Verhey he's going to play because I don't think he's played all preseason. And on top of that, he's been in a lot of, you know, non-contact, um, you know, practices or just skating on his own. Um, you know, I kind of made the joke that, you know, he's been kind of off this offseason because he's recovering from carrying the Panthers in the playoffs. So, you know, he's had to recover from that. But, you know, it'll be, I'll be interested to see how he looks. And then, uh, you know, as you said, Sam Bennett and uh, Chuck will be in there. Um, I'm just looking for them to kind of get their legs under them and be able to put a few plays together and just kind of get, you know, tuned up for the season. So um, won't be surprised if, you know, the Panthers don't come away with this one. But uh, I am looking to see if there's anybody who's kind of on the bubble to kind of make an impact. Yeah, and uh, Verhage did play in the first uh, double um, doubleheader game where Barkoff got the game winner against Nashville, and he played in that uh game against the Carolina Hurricanes where it was, mm, okay. uh, Panthers vets versus youngsters of the Carolina Hurricanes last Thursday where the the Panthers just looked flat in that 5-2 loss uh last Thursday. And yeah, a, a lot of the a lot, you were talking about some of the battles uh for for the Panthers uh, as far as like trying to make a ro- a roster spot for for this team. Of course, there's still um the the seventh defenseman and Matt Kirsten and, and Michael Delzato uh, as far as them battling it out. And of course there's a few forward spots left. Justin Sordiff uh, did not play in, uh, on, in Thursday's game. They said he's cleared to skate, but he, Paul Maurice did speak about after the game, how the, he, they didn't want to put him out on the ice. So do we see him in a final preseason game against Tampa? But Justin Sordiff also confirmed himself that they want him to get a few skates in before being sent down. So he's already been told that he will start the season in Charlotte. So I'm not expecting him to to make it just yet. So mm-hmm. kind of, um and also uh another player trying to fight for a uh for, forward spot as well. Chris Tierney is another guy who's trying to, to trying to battle. So those are kind of a little bit of the forward battles and of course we spoke about in segment number 1 Alexi Hepaniemi which I doesn't give me a reason. I don't have a reason to believe that he won't be be there. But of course, there's still a few more battles. Uh, Gerald Mayhew is is, uh, is another guy as well trying to uh, make the team. So uh, three forwards mostly to keep an eye out on, and two defensemen. Uh, re- really five players to really keep a close eye on as far as who is going to be the guys making the roster. All you can ask for is competition, that every guy goes out there and plays their hardest to prove that they deserve to be on this team. Um, I think the Panthers now have the luxury of being able to, um, you know, encompass that competition, whereas in years past, you know, I'm not saying recently, but, you know, probably, you know, last five, six years, maybe that competition wasn't quite there. And it kind of showed you had a lot of inexperience in the lower lines, but now 
um, you know, with the elevation of probably E2 Lewis Duran into the third line, which I think, you know, he's flourished in the last year. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, definitely the prize from uh, the Trocheck tra- trade. But um, I, I think right now, I think the first three lines are pretty much solidified. It's who's going to come to play for the fourth line. And it'll be interesting to see if, uh, you know, those younger guys are here to actually make that. So maybe Hepo Niami does come to play and he makes a fourth line. Uh, but I'm wondering if any kind of veteran is going to eke it out. Um, one thing I was thinking about the other day is Eric Stahl. Yes. I haven't really heard too much about him, but it would make sense to me that he makes his team or is a part of the team because guess who his coach was when he came in? Paul the Marie. league. Paul Maurice. So he's very familiar with him. I think he understands the system he's going to try and play, and he needs that type of veteran leadership on the bench. So it would not surprise me if we find Eric Stahl as the 4C. Mm-hmm. And Eric Stahl winning a Stanley Cup in his second season uh, shortly after Paul Maurice uh, m- m- had his departure from there. Mm-hmm. So that familiarity comes from 10, fi- 10, 15 years ago already. So it's been a relationship that's been uh, building uh, there. So it's, it won't, n- I don't think anyone's going to be surprised if Eric Stahl makes the team. But hey, that, that also creates flexibility with guys who are mostly centers going on the wing and Anton Lindell has a possibility to be on even Barkov's wing, which that will be kind of fun to watch. Another, uh, another guy also that I ha- I did not mention of a, an opportunity to make the team. Chances are he's going to start in Charlotte, but still an opportunity to show what he's got is Logan Hutsko. He's still with the team. Uh, they went 11 F 7D uh, yet um, last night. And Logan Hutsko was on that, on that uh, fourth line. Of course, some double shifting I saw from Zach Delpy, uh, as well, playing on that line as uh, on his uh, as a second go round of his shift, double shifting, and so uh, Logan Hutsko, uh will likely get another game, but I think that he's going to be uh, starting off in uh, Charlotte as well. But maybe one, maybe going to have his first call up uh, this this year for for the Panthers. Uh, so we're 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 gonna we're gonna need to see to see Denisenko, of course. Uh, get get another another chance because he's probably gonna be the first one of the of the young guys called up and then probably uh next one is gonna be uh maybe Logan Hutsko in, in the mix. If Heponiemi is still he if mm-hmm. Heponiemi is still on the NHL roster then Hutsko is gonna be the po- possibly the second one. But first is probably you, you wanna give you wanna give uh Dennis Anko all the chances that he can get. But of course this is a new coaching staff. There's no uh there's no emotional connection to bringing them in. So it, we, we, I could be wrong. I could be wrong when it comes to who's going to be the guy to be first called up uh, uh, later this season. For sure. And, uh, you know, to, to give Dennis Senko a little bit of breathing room, you know, he had a major injury last season, you know, you know, breaking his knee or, you know, his kneecap breaking. <laughs> That's kind of weird to say that. Um so, you know, I, I think they will give him a chance and he'll get a shot and everything. But, you know, it's it's been a few years since he was drafted and everything. And now, and you know, we got to start seeing some development. we got to start showing that he understands the game and that he's going to be able to be a contributor. Um, now, with this team being primed to make the playoffs and hopefully have a deep run, do you think they're going to call up somebody young or do you think they're going to call up a veteran first to kind of plug in? That. Yeah. So right. I, I could see like a, a Zach Delpy. Mm-hmm. Uh, coming in first just to kind of fill in for a game or two, um, you know, in case they are in like a stretch run or they're on the road and everything, they just need that veteran presence in the lineup. And if it's like more than a, if, if it's for one game, yes. But if it's like for more than a week of, at a time, we could see a younger, younger person just to, just to get the, just to get those legs moving and to get the, and to get uh, more of a feel of what the NHL is like for, for these guys. So it's all going to be situational and Zach Delpy, a break break in case of emergency that's really how how i'm seeing uh his role for the panthers uh these lo- these last few seasons that's for sure but nick this was another fun fairbanks friday edition of the show glad to have you back on the show next week this a week from today we will be discussing a show breaking down the first game of the season so next week will be a game one of 82 recap edition of Fairbanks Friday here on the Locked On Florida Panthers podcast. Tell everybody where they can find you online. Thank you again for having me on. Uh, Great to break down another game, and I can't wait to get the season going so we can break down a lot more. Um, Everybody can find me on Twitter at Prudentia Zero. 
uh, looking forward to the full season uh, with you and everything. So thank you for having me back. Absolutely, Nick. And I will see you next week. Yes, sir. And if you like what you're hearing, please subscribe to the podcast to be notified every single time the Lockdown Florida Panthers podcast jumps into your podcast feed. Make sure to subscribe to Lockdown Fantasy Hockey with Flip Livingstone and Steel Roden. We'll be covering all the preseason activities around the National Hockey League. Thank you for making the Lockdown Florida Panthers podcast your first listen of the day. And for your second listen of the day, make sure to listen to today's episode of Locked On NHL. Locked On experts provide you a daily 30-minute podcast Monday through Friday on all things National Hockey League. Locked On NHL, your daily 30-minute NHL podcast. Sorry, Marmando Velez with Nick Fairbanks. And you've been listening to Locked On Florida Panthers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day.